uh, a lot of stuff did not get finished. And what I, what I know, I've, I've got a lecture here, as you can see, uh, this is one I gave, developed ages ago at um, UWS, and you can see it's got in four hours. Well, we've got three, as you know. And what I also did in this particular lecture, I assumed a rather larger, uh, ra rather deeper level of knowledge of mathematics than I know I can assume here. So I just assumed students were to work out. And this, I did the, the calculations, but I thought I could give students a set of differential equations. They work out the equilibrium. Do it in one slide, okay? So some people, if we've got the engineering trained people, can you whack your hands up? And no Nick is. Who else? Okay. This will be suck egg stuff to you guys. And who's done no mathematics since high school? And who's done a bit of mathematics between, yeah, okay. So what I ended up trying to do was to write, and this is the intention, I had to write a long um, explanation of what dynamics is about, trying to do the maths as simply as possible, and starting right from why do economists get it wrong with the way that they teach mathematics, which basically drops dynamics out. And I didn't get it finished. I'm about, this is about a 25-page document right now. So what I'm going to keep on doing is I'll, I'll send that all to you as a PDF. I'll actually use Canvas to do that, despite my antipathy towards Canvas. Uh, so I'll do that in the next uh, couple of days. I'll, probably do, I'll do it. I've said I've got done tonight, and I'll post the rest as I keep on working on it later. What I realise, it's actually the beginning of doing part of what I'll be doing is my magnum opus, which is I need to make it something which can be read by students. There's no point talking to my fellow economists, my neoclassicals, obviously. But you know, in, in that sense, I want to write which is accessible to people who, who want to start taking a non-orthodox non approach to economics but don't necessarily have the mathematics training. And the beauty of Blatt's book is that he wrote that book on dynamic economic systems back in the 80s, knowing that economists knew no one knew as much mathematics as he did. So what he did was, and this is what I'll be copying in the way that I do my book as well, not that I know anywhere near as much maths as Black does or did, is that he had, he'd have a verbal explanation for everything and then an appendix to each chapter. Have you had a good look at it so far? Or? Uh, not yet. Okay, but you've, you've ch flicked through a bit. And, yeah, yeah. And I just received an email that uh, the book has arrived here. So. Oh, okay, so you haven't actually seen it yet. Yeah. So like, I regard that as the, uh, the best book, both a combination on the history of economic thought and on dynamics as well for... Um, uh, for a con for well that's been written. Uh, there's, you know, there are plenty of others that are um, have a deeper knowledge, history, economic thought, and so on. But Black combined what he knew about mathematics, where he was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, and was actually involved in, in building the world's second ever computer, which was built at Sydney University back in the um, I've forgotten what years it would have been in the 50s. I think he was a research. He was a, a PhD student at that stage. Uh, so incredibly skilled at mathematics. Um, the reason he's nominated, he wrote the textbook on quantum mechanics in the 50s. Okay. Um, but anyway, so he wrote this book called Dynamic Economics. I think I've told you the story about where the book came from. Have I mentioned the story? I haven't. Okay. Uh, he was he became uh, head of school at the University of New South Wales. He's an Austrian refugee from the you know the, 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 the diaspora getting away from the Nazis. Austrian refugee to Australia as a young, a young man, I think. Uh, father came out, he came up with his parents. And um, he was a you know, truly gifted mathematician, apparently a really, really difficult person. He'd always be complaining about people and saying how stupid his PhD students were, that sort of thing. Uh, so he intimidated everybody. Um, but he was at New South Wales, and there's a tr truly lovely gentleman called Murray Kemp, who was also at the University of New South Wales, and Murray was a, uh, twice nominated, once nominated for the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work in international trade. Now, I've got to say Murray's one of the nicest people I've ever known, except for one thing, he's always beaten me at tennis. Okay? He's a good, good guy. Uh, but anyway, uh, Murray, because Murray had been nominated for the Nobel Prize and, and John had also been nominated, Murray thought, well, the only person I've really got as a peer at UNSW is John Blatt, so I'll invite him to a seminar, which he did. And he gave a presentation, typical uh, neoclassical Hexer Island style extended international trade model. And John was sitting, I, I, have, I wasn't there, but I've been told this story by several people. John was sitting at the back of the room. Um, I don't know where he's sitting in the room, sitting in the room. And uh, Murray basically turned to him and asked him what he thought of his presentation. And Black said something to the tune of, 
That is the greatest load of rubbish I've sat through in, my, in, in decades. If this is what you think is advanced economics, there's something seriously wrong with economics, I intend finding out what it is. Went off and did several years of reading of economics. Um, ended up then doing, I think as he's in his retirement period, lecturing at the University of Sydney and scaring the pants off the students I knew who went there who had him as a lecturer as well, same sort of intimidating style. But he wrote a brilliant book. And so I'm still um, talking. I spoke with the family some time ago about trying to get it uh, reproduced as uh, in reprinted because it's out of print. And that's why you find the price. What did you see as the price for Amazon? Did you look? Uh, it was uh, between 100 and 600. Yeah. Okay. So not cheap to get a. I, I bought a copy way, way back. It's the second most thumb book that I have. The most thumb book is the limits to growth. Um, but it just what I, what I did was, you know, somehow this ended up on my, web, my website. Okay. So one of these days, I hope I can get it reprinted properly. But uh, it happens to be sitting there. I'll put it up on my Patreon blog as well. But if you want to get a look at it, this, this is, I think, a brilliant introduction to history of economic thought and a brilliant book on dynamics in general and economics. And I intend copying a similar sort of style to the way the Black set this book out when I write my magnum opus. And it has to include more of an introduction to maths than, than Blatt had, because what he was doing is writing for economists um, who said, don't have enough mathematics to understand what I'm doing, so I would have gentled them through it. So verbal explanations in the, in the chapters themselves, some mathematics as well, normally numerical examples, and then the appendices with the mathematics to a level at which he thought economists could understand the maths. Uh, and in fact, even one part of it, he apologises to mathematicians for one of the proofs he uses. He said, because I, I'm terribly sorry about how, 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 how juvenile this proof is, but I'm teaching it to a math economist, and they don't have enough maths to understand it, so please let me do this simple... You know, he knew how to make friends and influence people. Uh, but anyway, it's a brilliant, brilliant book, and that's where you can find it, on my debt deflation blog, and I'll back it up on, on, uh, on Patreon as well, and hopefully one of these days I manage to get it republished. So that's, that's if you want a, a damn good introduction to dynamics, that's where I suggest you start. There's one other book which I'll recommend as well, nowhere near as expensive. Uh, Dom, you've had a bit of a look at it, haven't you? That's the, uh, the Martin Braun book. The Martin Braun so, no. no, you have the yellow one. Oh yes. Okay. What well, to tell the class what you think of it? The one on mathematical dynamics. Yeah, yeah. The dynamics one. Yeah. What did you think of it? Trying to read it. It's quite good. Yes. Pardon? It's good. Yes. It's good. It's it's well written. I'll just actually show this one as well. So, uh, I, I I bought Braun after I'd learned differential equations from uh, the from Black's successes at UNSW. Um, and I didn't, I didn't learn from this book, but I thought I'll need a reference. And I spotted it and thought, oh, this looks OK, I'll buy it in the, in the bookshop. And I found it's actually beautifully written. It's, uh, it explains the basics of going from differential equations and difference equations all the way through to partial differential equations, mainly works with ordinary differential equations. Um, but it's written like a novel in some ways. I mean, for example, have you heard of uh, the Van Meegen art forgeries? At all? I haven't. Okay. You know the idea of carbon dating. Okay. Well, carbon dating uses radioactive decay to say how old something is. But how do you actually do it? Well, there's, he uses an example of a German, of an, I think he was a Dutch art dealer called, I think it's Van Meegen. I'll just search and see. Uh, no, I can't search. I haven't got it here. Okay. I think it's Van Meegen, who was imprisoned after the Second World War as a Nazi collaborator because he sold a lot of famous artworks to the Nazis. Only he said, I didn't sell them the artworks, I sold them forgeries. And everybody said, "That's who did the forgeries? He said, well, I did. He said, oh, you're, a, you're a second-rate artist. You couldn't possibly reproduce these marvellous paintings that we found you'd sold to the Nazis. So in his prison cell, he started doing it again, using his techniques to make a modern painting look like it's four or 500 years old. And as they're watching, they realise he actually he was a second-rate original, second-rate original painter, but a first-rate copier of ancient works. So he's, they changed his, changed his crime from collaboration to forgery. Poor bastard, died in jail, I think. Anyway, what 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 um, you, in in this book, Boron explains in about 14 pages, I think, how you actually use carbon dating. 
how that actually showed that the the the, the uh, a painting was not used painted using paints which are 500 years old, which the paints he was the paintings he was forging, but ones which were recent. So I highly recommend that book if you want to start learning dynamics really really well. The combination of the two, that for the mathematical techniques and Blatt for how you apply it to economics. But what I'm going to try to do today is cover a bit of that, and it's going to be patchy because I said I didn't get a chance for you know, personal reasons to finish writing the lecture. So what I'm starting with is if you look at how economists are trained, forget this stuff on the right-hand side over here. I'll just move back. Hang on. I'll just get rid of this. This is an explaining part of it, and I realised I didn't need this explanation, so I'll just move that sideways. Okay. When you look at how economists start trained, this is the very first diagram they get, the old supply and demand argument. You've got demand as a declining function of price, supply as a rising function of price, well, of quantity. They talk about them being inverse demand functions, etc., etc. The time completely disappears. And if you actually want to do dynamics, time has to be an essential part of it. So what I've got here is just four very simple equations which each depend upon time in some way. So I've got A is a function of time is equal to 1. In other words, you've got a constant. So no matter what value of time is, that, that the red line is always at 1. Uh, I've got a sine wave, so it fluctuates over time. I've got a constant rising, so it's going getting, getting linear bigger over time. And the classic differential equation, as well, I'll show, which is the value of some system d at time t is an exponent, the value e, an exponential function, e raised to the power of t. So it just grows exponentially over time. Now, I know this is boring as batshit for the people who've done engineering, but a bit of an intro for those who haven't. You've all seen those equations, I imagine? You've done? Nothing, you know, they're, they're quite straightforward. What I want to explain is, is why the exponential equation turns up so easily because, and, and what we are talking about with dynamics in general. Because at a fundamental level, when you're trying to represent some real-world system in mathematics, which is what we're doing here, what you're saying is this, a, a dynamic system is one where the, the rate of change of the system is some function of its current values, current or lag values. Economists try to do some of their work, the neoclassicals do, by presuming people have got a future value they're heading to the idea of forward-looking expectations. I'll use them there, DSG models. But a fundamental dynamic one says you, your rate of change of your system is some function of its current value. Now, just putting that in general terms, you say the rate of change of Y is equal to the change in Y over the change in time. That's the basic idea of a dynamic system. And if you take the limit as the units of time go to smaller and smaller units, and it goes from delta Y, change in the value of the system, divided by delta T, to dy dt, and that's the idea of a differential equation. So, um, and most people, if you haven't actually done differential equations, people tend to think they're simple because you've done differentiation. So you've all done differentiation at some stage. Who's done differential equations? Again, it's going to be Nick and you two. You've done differential equations. Anybody else? Differential equations at all? A bit? A bit, OK. Because um, when you do differentiation, it's one of my lecturers at New South University described it being like money for old rope. In other words, it's so simple, you get paid to do something that's just really quite mechanical. So if you take a function like this one here, which is obviously quite a... It's a messy function. I've got y at time t is equal to sine t times cosine t divided by t squared times the log of t multiplied by e to the power of t. Bloody complicated, OK? You can feed that into any old symbolic processing language like the one I'm using here, which is MathCAD, and it'll differentiate it for you. Okay? It's a set of rules can be applied. For virtually every equation can be differentiated. So they're going from, a, uh, from a, an equation where Y's, Y's system is defined in terms of other functions, not itself. Okay? It's really easy to do the differentiation. You spend a lot of time learning how to do it, but, it, but it's, it's organ grinder, monkey, monkey stuff. Now, here is an incredibly simple differential equation. So I've said to find an equation as y at time t is equal to the sine of y at time t. Okay? So the value of the system depends upon the rate of change of the system. I'm now saying, what's the rate of change of y? Uh, well, it depends upon the current value of the system. And that's, that's the, what comes out of that very simple equations and you do y dt equals the sine of sine of y t. That's all it's assigning there. That's MathCAD's solution for that. 
so you notice what's going on. It's incredibly complicated. And you wouldn't think something that simple had a solution that complicated if you used a differentiation. Okay? So differential equations are very, very different. And the reason is that not only are they much more complicated to do, most of them can't be solved. Now, this is one thing which maths, maths classes do teach this. They tell people, OK, the vast majority of equations can't be solved for this reason. But then to make it possible to get the practice you need to do this stuff, they set a whole lot of examples which have been chosen so that they have solutions. Okay? So what tends to happen for a lot of even mathematicians, they go through doing it thinking, oh, yeah, we can solve all these things. In fact, there's a very, very strict but simple rule that says that only if an equation can be put in this form can it be solved. And if you think about a differential equation, which I've got here, I'm saying dy dt is some function of y and t at the same time. I was actually lost a bit of the... Hang on, why is that? There we go, OK. Um, I can actually re-express that equation as... The, there I've got the rate of change of y at t is some function of y and, and time at y, y at t and time itself. That's expressing it as an, what's called an ordinary differential equation. There's just one argument going in, which is t is the argument to work out what y is. But it's also possible to rework it and say, well, I can treat that as a function of both y and t at the same time. So rather than saying it's the differential of just y, I'm saying it's the differential of y and t, just combining them together. It's, you've got to monkey around with the terms a bit, but it's restating it. It's a partial differential equation depending upon y and t as two separate arguments, okay? even though they're related to each other. Now, I was going to try to explain that here, but I realised I'd be getting like diving into the deep end of the pool far too rapidly if I did. The only time, well, once you've got it stated that way, um, th this is now saying you know, the rate of change of the function is some function of its current values. The only form in which that equation can be solved is where f of, t, f of y and t equals zero. Okay? So that, that's the general statement of a differential a system of a differential equations in terms of y and t, but only if that final value is zero can you actually get a solution to it, which in, by solution I mean something that drops out all the ddts. Okay? It just has a, a, it defines y in terms of some other functions, not including the rate of change of y itself. So only in that tiny, tiny number of cases can you actually do it. It's, it's got something to do with the, with the order in which you differentiate. You have, a, you have what's called a partial differential equation. You've got a difference between, say, um, let's say looking at uh, x, um, x and y as functions, as, as a, 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 very, a function being a, the result of inputs of x and y. Well, differentiating with respect to x first and then y has exactly the same result of doing it y and then x. And the only case in which that actually works is where the final equation there is equal to zero. So most of the time, you can't solve these equations. And what that means is, of course, you've got equations which actually describe a real system, and you can't solve them. So what does a mathematician do? Works out ways to numerically simulate them. Okay? And this is a huge part. You, you, you do as much as you can to rework the equations so you get them in a form where you can solve them. But you know there's some you can't. So mathematicians have developed techniques to approximate these numerically and to solve them as, as, as best they can with numerical approximations, <coughs> transformations, and so on. And this has been going on for decades, of course. Um, but an essential part of it is knowing the... <coughs> pardon me. Knowing that you can accurately approximate these systems, even though some of them are chaotic. And there's a whole lot of theorems about that as well. So I'll, I'll go through and talk about all of those um, in Run or Write the Book. I, was, I just did not want to get into them now because it just gets far too hairy. But if you think about the simplest differential equation, and this is um, putting differential equations in the context of equations in general, when you do differentiation, you're saying the rate of change of y is some function of x. Okay? When you're doing a differential equation, you're saying the rate of change of y is some function of y. That's what makes it more complicated. But this, it actually starts from a very simple point of view, because imagine you're talking about the rate of growth of the uh, population of the UK. Uh, well, the rate of growth of the population of the UK is about 
0.6% per annum. That's the current rate of growth of the population. That's saying the rate of change, the percentage rate of change of the population is 0 0.06, uh, 0 0.006 times time. Now, if you look at that and say, what does that mean? Well, the population, say, uh, 66.5 million, then there'll be a 0 0.006 times 66.5 million increase in the population this year. That's saying the rate of change of the population is 0 0.006 times the current value of the population. So the essential differential equation is simply percentage rate of change. Okay, and you've all done percentage rates of change. So it's a case of how do we extend that knowledge further to be able to model much more complex systems than just assuming a linear rate of population growth. So what I'm doing here, this is just a screenshot from Minsky, um, but that's what's showing the basic dynamics. I'll bring that up if I can rapidly find it here. Just give me a second to search and find it. My computer's starting to die of old age. Okay, so painfully simple, but it's just saying the current level of the population multiplied by the growth rate uh, integrated is, is the current level of the population. That's the equation, again, sitting over here. Let's just see if I can make that larger. Hang on. Painfully simple. But sitting behind being able to simulate it is a whole lot of... Uh, advanced work by mathematicians over the years. So we have that. Come on, work. OK, this is not going to work. That's really useful. <coughs> OK, simple differential equation, simulate it, and you get, oh, what the hell happened here? E to the x. I'll just, I must have deleted something. Pardon me, hang on. Let's try it again. Great. Pardon me. I thought I had that one properly wired up. Should be either... Ah, T. I need T going in there. Oh, that's not well done at all, but finally got ex exponential growth. I should have fit in a... Um, uh, Bloody hell, I thought I'd fix that up. Let's see. No, OK, well, I have to leave that one un done badly. But let's just take a look. The basic idea of an exponential equation, you've all seen this sort of process growing over time and growing faster as time goes on. Now, when I apply it to... Um, in MathCAD, what I'm doing here is saying there's the equations from Minsky. I'm now saying, well, I can actually get exactly the same expression here. I've got the rate of change of y is y times a. I can then work that with an initial value of 66.5 million people and a growth rate of 0 0.006. Exactly the same result is returned by saying population at time t is 66.5 times e raised to the point 0 0.006 times time. So what you're doing when you're solving a differential equation is ending up putting it in that form, if you can solve them. So what I want to do for today is start doing some of that exercise uh, for saying how you go about doing it. Now, when you look at the way the exponential equation is defined, there are some equations which are defined in mathematics by their differentials or by their integrals. And the differential equation is the... the, the um, basic definition of, a, of an exponential equation is something whose rate of change is its current value. Okay. So when I'm when we're talking about the rate of growth of population being 0 0.006 times the current value, the very simplest differential equation is to say the rate of change of y is equal to the current value of y. So what that means is the slope of the line throughout is equal to the value of the line at that point. So if you look at this point here, this is a graph of, of, uh, of time uh, for the times the value of the exponential equation. When you start off with the, um, the value of the function is 1, which it is when t is equal to 0, e raised to the 0 is 1, the slope is also 1. When you get to the point where you've got the value of, uh, of 20, which occurs here, then the slope is also 20. 
etc. Et so it's defined in terms of its slope. And as it happens, when you get a value of 1, for, given that function, when the time is equal to 1, the value of the function is, is E, the exponential, uh, the, 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 the magic uh, transcendental number E, and that's got a value of 2.7828, etc., etc. It's, it's got the same... Um, e has the same role in mathematics in a sense that pi has. It's an absolutely vital number for defining our reality. It happens to have a decimal expansion of 2.78, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so that's, that's the value. What we're doing is we're taking a generally stated function, which might be quite complicated, and reducing it, if we can, to the product and the sums of exponentials raised to various powers. So to take you through the... just to show you how that works, imagine we've got this very simple equation here, which is the basic definition of a... Uh, of an exponential system. The rate of change of y is the current value of y. Its value at 0 times 0 is equal to 1. So that's the strict definition of the exponential. And I can ask MathCAD just to give me the solution for that with time ranging from 0 to 2 seconds. So what I get, there's that equation, and there's the value of e raised to the power of 2, and they're identical. So it's just mapping from the differential equation to a closed solution in terms of e raised to the power of t. Now, what you'll get as an exercise if you're doing mathematics, and you have to go through some of this stuff for the same reason that if you want to learn tennis, you've got to practice. Okay? Knowing how to hit a forehand is not the same as hitting a forehand. Knowing how to play music is not the same as playing music. You've got to actually do the practice. So what you'll find in a textbook like this one, are masses and masses of equations of this form where you've got a second order differential equation. So you're saying here the rate of change of the rate of change plus the rate of change plus the value is equal to zero. And that's a standard equation you'll be set for solving differential equations. Uh, so this one says uh, some constant A multiplied by the acceleration of the system plus another constant multiplied by the rate of change of the system plus the third constant multiplied by where the system currently is, all equal to zero. So how do you solve it? Well, the trick that I was taught very well by uh, the mathematicians I learned in undergraduate days from, the guy called, um, called um, I can't think his first name, but Professor Williams at Sydney Uni, he said there are two rules to mathematics. Just two. What have you got you don't want? Get rid of it. What have you got that you, what you don't have that you need? Put it in. I've added a third rule, keep it balanced, do the same thing on both sides of the equal sign. What he's really saying is, if you have something you don't understand, keep working with it without changing its meaning until it's in a form you do understand. And that's the basic thing you're doing with mathematics all the time. So one thing we don't yet understand is differential equations. Okay. This is a complicated, at the moment, for most of us, a complicated expression. But what most of us do understand is polynomials. Linear, a linear equation, y equals ax plus b, a, a, a para, parabola, y equals ax plus a plus bx plus cx squared, etc., etc. You know all those things. So what mathematicians do is say, well, let's map. Can we map from something we don't, we don't understand to something we do? Can we go from differential equations to polynomials? And the answer is you can. And the way that it's done is to say, well, here we've got an expression which is quite complicated. So we've got A times the acceleration of a system. Let's go back and I'll bring that one up here. So you're starting from this one. A times the rate of change of the system plus B times the rate of acceleration of the system plus B times its rate of change plus C times its current value is equal to zero. Complicated. What they say, let's guess the solution involves an exponential because we know, as I've shown you, that when you have something where the differential returns its current value, that's an exponential equation. So what you guess, and I've made it slightly simpler than it should be, but this will, this will do for exposition, is say that we're going to guess that the value of y at time t is e multiplied by some constant lambda, raised to the power multiplied by t. So you're going to guess the solution is e time, raised to the power of lambda times t. Okay, that's your guess. Now you feed then and see what happens. Well, if that's... If that's the value of, of y at t, then the differential of the dy dt is going to be the differential of that expression. And this is a rule I'm presuming you all know. It's the, it's the, the, uh, 
the product rule. If I've got e raised to the lambda times t and I differentiate it, I get back lambda times e to the lambda times t. You know that one? Have you all done that rule in calculus? Okay. And equally, the same for the second, second order differential, it becomes lambda squared times e to the lambda times t. So I make these substitutions. I'm going to substitute that y is equal to e to the rate lambda times t. The rate of change of e to the lambda times t is lambda times e to the lambda times t. You're seeing lots of lambdas in this lecture. And the second differential of e to the lambda times t is lambda squared times e to the lambda times t. So you substitute that in there, and what you get out is this expression. You've got rid of the differentials, and you've now got something. I'll bit, I mean, make a bit, um, I wonder if the zoom is working. Let's see. No. OK. I don't know why it's not working on this software. Uh, let's make it larger. Not quite as flexible as working in um, PowerPoint, but I want to be able to show some of the mathematics as I go on here. OK. So what I've now got is an expression if with a times lambda squared times e to the lambda t plus b times lambda times e to the lambda t plus c times e to the lambda t, there's e to the lambda t throughout. Now, one thing about the exponential is never zero. Okay? e to the minus infinity times is still... You've got to get right to the minus infinity to get to the stage where you get a zero out of it. So we know I can group those all together and say that whole expression is e to the lambda t times a times lambda squared plus b times lambda plus c. It's equal to zero. Now, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to work out what value of lambda is going to give us a function which has exactly the same behaviour as the differential equation that we're trying to do. So what we've done by this rigmarole, and it is obviously a rigmarole, is get to the stage where, to work out lambda's value, we've got to find the roots of a polynomial. Now, we all know the formula for that, quadratic. Okay. So the whole idea of doing this is to reduce a problem which is complicated, one we don't actually know how to solve initially, to one that is easy to solve because we have a formula for it. And that's the basic idea of, of doing this part of the exercise. You get to what's called a characteristic equa equation. The solutions to that characteristic equation then give you values you can plug back into your guess answer, and that will be the right answer. That's the whole idea of this procedure. Now, uh, you'd normally be doing masses and masses of these. If you're doing an actual maths class, you'd be doing dozens of examples of this, trying to get your, your head around it. I'm going to show you a quick overview of how it's done. Um, but obviously here, I've got, I've got the... To get the solution for lambda, I now need to find what values for lambda give me zero. Now, that's pretty much ask, that is asking where does a parabola across the x-axis, OK? And so we know the roots are going to be these two. It's going to be minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. That's something virtually every school student can recite because they've done it almost any level of mathematics will be doing that at some point. So that's what you feed that in, and you've got your solution. And then e raised... It's, it's, of course, there are two solutions. So your solution to this particular equation is going to have two bits, and you're going to have to work out what actual value fits the equation you've got. You've got to have multiplied by constants as well because there'll be a whole family of different solutions to this equation, depending upon where the system moves through time. If I'm using a population for the UK, I've got to know the UK's initial population. If I knew the rate of change and the rate of change of the rate of change, I'd need to know the population of the UK at a particular point in time and the rate of change. And then I could use those two conditions to say, well, that's the curve that fits the UK. There'll be a different one for America, different one for uh, Botswana, etc., etc. Once you've got them, you can say you can tie it down precisely and say, with these constants times these exponentials added together, I can predict the future course of this country's population, you know, until the the uh, estimates start to become inaccurate. So let's go back to a normal view here now. So and it's, this is a long dive. The more I wrote this, the more I realised I was diving in to a whole lot of stuff that's going to have the people who know their mathematics going on board here. What can I do? Where can I get a cup of coffee? with the others saying, what the hell is this stuff? Where's the economics got to? So this is a bit of a, bit, a, bit of a statement saying, what we're doing is, is, it, is, is through the baby steps you need to be doing 
to know how to analyse a dynamic system as far as you, as you can analyse it and then apply it to economics. So at the end of the lecture, I'll get to applying this to economics, but this is a bit of a rave here about why you have to go through doing all this stuff. Um, now, when you think about the, with the simple equation I've shown you, which is a second order linear ordinary differential equation. Okay? That's the, the basic thing you start learning from. Um, there's, it's, the solution can be find, found by saying, where does a parabola cross the x-axis? Now, at the simplest level, there are three answers to that. It crosses twice, and where it crosses can have two values that are negative, two values that are positive, or one that's negative and one that's positive. That's the simplest situation. That's what uh, the ancient Greeks thought were the only situations until somebody drew a parabola that didn't cross the x-axis. Okay? So, in fact, there's more than those solutions. That, that's, when that happens, your, your polynomial, your, your quadratic, can be factored into two linear equations multiplied together. Okay? Because what you're saying is this particular equation here, uh, lambda squared plus 4 times lambda plus 3, is equal to lambda minus uh, um, plus 1 multiplied by lambda plus 3, okay? which are two linear equations. And the product is lambda squared plus 4 lambda plus 3. And that will cross the x-axis, where lambda is equal to minus 1 and lambda is equal to minus 3. Okay? Now, when you've, the whole point for doing this is saying, well, lambda is now the term that tells me the value of the exponentials in this function. And if I've got e multiplied by e to the minus 3 times t and e multiplied by minus 1 times t, what's the value as t goes to infinity? Zero. Okay. So it's going to converge to an equilibrium of zero. What about if I have the, the second one I'm showing here? Uh, that's going to be, well, that, that's minus, that, that's plus, e to, uh, lambda plus, was that lambda minus 3 times lambda plus plus 1, so I get lambda squared plus 2 lambda minus 3. That's going to have roots which are involved um, minus 3 and 1. So I've got e to the minus 3 times time plus e to the t, e to the 1 times time. What's going to happen to that over time? It's going to go to infinity. e to the t, the positive term, diverges away. Uh, but there's a the, and the other one here I've got two that are both positive, the, one, the roots 1 and 3, so e cubed, e, e t to the 3 times t plus e to the 1 times t, it's going to go really quickly towards infinity. Uh, but there's one other case, and that's, well, let's get rid of this, um, where one is positive and one is negative. What's that look like? Any idea? That is what's called a saddle equilibrium. So what I do is I go through each of them over time. If you have one where they're both negative, then your solution, in this case, is going to be y at t is going to be some constant times e uh, raised to the power of minus 1 times t. That's going to shrink towards 0 over time. Plus another constant times e to the minus 3 over t. That'll shrink even faster. That'll converge to 0. Now, what you have to do, and this is there's a lot of necessary grunt work in this, is given that system, that system might be describing a spring, for example. So you've got a weight on a spring. It's facing some resistance. So over time, it's going to stop fluctuating. The question is, what length will the spring be when it stops fluctuating? That type of question. That's what this is all set for. And that depends upon the resistance of the spring and the amount of friction in the system. So what people will do is be set a problem and they've then got to work out what the constants are to match the actual behaviour of the, of the model. Okay? So that's, again, the maths engineering students have done this at nauseam in first year, first year classes. So what you've got to do, as well as getting the solution here for the value you raise e to the power of, to talk about its dynamics over time, to situate that curve as a system, you've got to say, what constant am I multiplying the first one by and what constant am I multiplying the second one by? So again, this, this grunt part, again, I know this is dull, but it, I'll go through it as a, as a prerequisite. That part involves saying, well, what's the value at zero? You've got an initial, you, know, you start off at t is equal to zero. Well, at t is equal to zero, 
e to the minus 1 times t is 0, e to the zero, t is 0, so e to the minus 1 times t is e to the 0, and e to the 0 is 1. Any, any number raised to a power of 0 is 1. So what you can do is you get rid of that uh, e to the e bit, you're just left with c1 plus c2, and if you know that y at 0 is equal to 5, then you know you've got, a sim you've got a, the one of two simultaneous equations that describe the constant, saying c1 plus c2 equals 5. Okay. So you just need a second equation to tie down what those values are. And I've been very messy here because I, I didn't do the sort of thing you normally do in the maths textbook. You, you know what the answers are, first of all, so you work out the, work out the values, the constants, yeah. your initial condition have to be to give you a nice, simple solution. I didn't do that here. But what I've said is just, let's say, the, the, uh, the, we know the value of the system at y equals at t equals 0 and t equals 1. So at t equals 0, now it's equal to 5. And at t equals 1, we know it's equal to minus 1.02343 41494. That happens to be a couple of powers of, of E added together. That's why it's so messy. But when you go through and work it out, you get two equations and two unknowns. There's the first one, which is quite simple. Ah, pardon me. This, hang on, I just might make this a bit smaller. Windows is not supposed to have that um, bar down the bottom in the way, but of course the bar down the bottom is in the way, so I'll just get out of zoom mode and, and I can see the scroll bar down here. So given those two equations, I can ask MathCAD to solve them for me and it tells me the value of C1 is minus 4 and the value of C2 is 9. Okay, so I now say I've now got this equation where, let's go down here, um, that's my solution for this particular partial differential equation given the initial conditions that y at 0 is 5 and y at 1 is that crazy negative value I gave in a moment ago. And then if we plot the two together, you see the, so the actual the value simulated by MathCAD using the tools that mathematicians have developed to simulate uh, dynamic systems. The value of that and the value of the function are identical. Okay? So that's what you're doing. You're getting a solution so you can express the system in terms of um, not in terms of rate of y and rate of change of y anymore, but y is a function of time with their exponentials. So that's that's the, the grunt you've got to go through. And if you do want to learn this stuff and actually apply it, I do recommend going through something like, again, this textbook and doing the exercises. Okay. And uh, there's another way to go about it. Has anybody seen the Khan Academy? Okay, you've all seen the Khan Academy? Log on there and that's extremely good uh, high quality tuition in mathematics, which to get to be fluent to this stuff, you have to learn it. Now, with a model like this, and I, this is where I, ha I haven't completed the lecture, so I feel a bit, uh, um, in um, I'll have to do more of this material later. When you've got a simple set of linear differential equations, the solution is a simple linear sum of the bits and pieces. So I've got, here's the uh, minus four times e to the minus one times t, which is the red line. Here's 9 times e to the minus 3 times t, which is the blue line. The sum is the black line. So it's a simple linear sum, and it doesn't change no matter where you are in the, in the universe. If you're miles and miles away from the equilibrium value of zero, those two things will converge to that equilibrium value over time. And the reason they converge is the bigger of the two values, which in this case is e to the minus 1 times t, dominates the other. And therefore, since e to the minus 1 t is, times t is negative, e to the minus 1 times t will go to zero as time goes on, and the system will converge to that value, the equilibrium value. And to illustrate it, I've, I've got... Uh, um, this is a little simple example here. If we take a look at um, e to the minus uh, 3 times t when t is equal to 10, that is absolutely tiny. Whereas e to the minus 1 times t is small, but nowhere that small. So the, the biggest of the two values dominates the behaviour of the system. And that's got the crazy name of dominant eigenvalue. Dominant because it's biggest, and eigen because eigen is German for own, and at the time these systems were worked out, mathematics, German was pretty much the language of mathematics. So they used eigen for saying this is the value that owns the system over time. So it sounds complicated, but that's what it means. It's the one that dominates it over time. And working it out matters because when you get a very complicated dynamic system, these are obviously very simple ones, uh, 
knowing what the dominant eigenvalue do, does tells you what the system does. Saying what's the biggest number that determines where the system goes over time. So you spend a lot of your time working out what's called the dominant eigenvalue. Now I give a few more examples here. This is one where there's um, two positive eigenvalues. And so long as you feed in initial conditions which aren't the equilibrium themselves, that's going to go to infinity. Okay. With different terms, I could go going to minus infinity, but it's going to diverge from the equilibrium. So you have simple case, both eigenvalues are negative, the dominant eigenvalue is negative, it will converge to the equilibrium. If you have two eigenvalues, they're both positive, it'll diverge from the equilibrium. The only one of these which is actually fun, in any sense at all, is where one's positive and the other's negative. Because what you'll get is for a while, the one which is a, a, a negative eigenvalue it could be very similar value to the one that's positive. Okay. So for a while it can look like it's converging. So you can see here zero is the equilibrium for this system. This is what's called a saddle node. As you converge towards it, you appear you might be converging and then you diverge. Okay. Now the logic of a saddle, and this matters because as it happens this underlies dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. The equilibrium of that system is what's called a saddle. It's got one dominant eigenvalue which is negative, which means you head towards equilibrium. It's got another which is positive, meaning you move away from the equilibrium. And it's called a saddle because if you actually draw it as a shape in a, um, in a drawing program, you will get something which looks like a horse's saddle. Now, if you imagine that horse's saddle, there's if you look right down the spine of the horse, that's a stable curve. If you could throw a marble so that it landed on the spine and exactly on the spine, not a tiny fraction either side, and the saddle was perfectly shaped, so it was absolutely the ideal shape of a saddle, that marble would slowly roll up and down and settle in the bottom. Okay. But if you're even the slightest bit off, it'll slide off the side very rapidly. So that's the behaviour of a saddle. And funnily enough, the neoclassicals did not want this outcome. This is one of the many times when mathematics led them to a trap they don't want. Because uh, this was first done by a, a polymath, a very young polymath, called... I don't know if I remember for names, I've been hit by too much booze last night. Uh, Ramsey. He was somebody who was a, a, a protege of Keynes, highly mathematical, highly gifted. And he set himself the question of asking, is there an optimal savings rate for an economy? Interesting question, okay. I reckon irrelevant to economics, but nonetheless that was the question he asked himself. And what he said, well, yes, there is an ideal rate. And the rate has two components to it. One is what is the determinant of utility, which is one equation. What's the determinant of productivity, which is another equation. And you put the system together and you found, he found that with lots of, you know, heroic assumptions about the economy. You can describe it using one set of preferences for the entire society, so there's no social classes to worry about. We don't live in a capitalist system. Okay. Um, uh, you have diminishing marginal productivity. You have an ideal labour capital ratio, etc., etc. He worked out there is an ideal point in the future, which he called the bliss point, quite literally, the point of bliss in the future. Can you get to the point of bliss? Terribly sorry, it's a saddle. Okay. Now, the only way you can actually get on that point, this point in the future is if you start off with initial conditions that mean you're on the, on the stable vector associated with the stable eigenvalue. So there's one eigenvalue which is negative. That's the, the magnitude. That's also got a direction, and that direction is precisely along the line, the spine of the horse. Okay? So if you happen to be standing right behind a horse and you throw a marble and it lands on that spine, you reach equilibrium. But if you're slightly off and you throw the marble, it's going to go sliding off the saddle. In terms of investment and consumption in the DSG model, what that means is the only way you can reach the bliss point in the future is if you change the initial conditions now so that your consumption and savings ratios happen to be on that curve. And then you throw the light ball forward and you'll, you'll get to this bliss point. So he said, yes, there is an ideal savings rate, but you've got to adjust consumption and savings now to be able to reach this future point because it's unstable. And you've presumed the idea of a central planner who could adjust consumption and investment 
so that you got onto this ideal point and you could converge in the future. Now, that is got bugger all to do with capitalism, OK, when you think about it. That's not capitalism at all. But the neoclassicals latched onto that model and said, well, we assume everybody is capable of working out where this bliss point is in the future. And therefore, if there's a change to technology and a change to preferences, that will move the location of the saddle in space, which means the stable eigenvector has now moved as well. So what you'll do, you'll have a shock to preferences and a shock to technology, and you'll then work out where the new saddle gets to, and you'll jump from where you are now to, the, to these, which is on the you're on the you're on the stable vector for one location of the saddle. The saddle jumps because of a shock, lands somewhere else, changes where the stable vector is. You jump to that point. That's how they explain the trade cycle. Well, great. Bugger all to do with genuine dynamics, but that's what they do. So the saddle has some relevance, but it's not the sort of stuff I want to get you, you stuck on because that's nonsense. That's not true dynamics at all. The idea that the <coughs> system can do a jump, they'll talk about jump variables and stuff like that. That's what's going on in the background of all that apparently mathematical nonsense they do in DSG models. Now, the point I want to get to... <coughs> pardon me. ..is the point where the pro we're talking about a genuine dynamic system. We're saying it, it follows a particular path over time. What about where the parabola doesn't cross the x-axis? And this was the dilemma that struck... I've forgotten who was the first person to discover it, but the first person to work out a solution... Thank you, Wikipedia. Um, ..was Raphael Bombelli. Ever heard of him before? You have? Yeah. No, I think he's actually Italian. So it says 1500s. But, yeah. OK. But he was the one who first worked out, well, let's just invent something that lets us solve the equation. Because what you're trying to do, is in, in, in terms of the certainly the old way solutions were done, you're trying to break a uh, quadratic down into two linear equations multiplied together, where the values for the linear side gave you the roots of the, of the, the, the points where the parabola crossed the x-axis. When it doesn't cross the x-axis, you can't do that. So you said, the reason is because your square root of b squared minus 4ac, b squared minus 4ac is a negative number. Okay. And they can't handle it. He said, let's just pretend that there's such a thing as a square root of minus 1. Let's call, it, call that value i, and let's call the actual number involved an imaginary number. So it was all done to be able to get a way of breaking down any equation now, including a parabola where it doesn't cross the x-axis. It was a way of working out how to solve it into two equations um, where you could find a solution by breaking this um, quadratic down into two linear equations. But linear equations involving what was called originally an imaginary number and now a complex one. So here's a few examples. So if you have uh, x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to 0, then your answer is going to be minus 1 over 2 plus the square root of 3 times i divided by 2. That'll be your solution. If I multiply those two together, so I might do that with MathCAD. That's one of the nice things about this particular program. Let's, I multiply that by that, and I'm just going to have to put in the... Um, x minus, so give me a sec here. Ah. ah, great, didn't do the expand. Hang on a sec. So I can get it to do an expansion for me. Pardon my croaky voice, but it's another thing I've been coping with. Uh, expand. OK, I've stuffed up somehow there. I'll need to check out and see why after the after, after we take a break. But um, go away. OK. But we now have equations involving imaginary terms. Now, as I said, it was done. This was done originally just so that you could solve quadratic equations. And there are three of the solutions. So one in one case, I've got a solution which 
is maintaining constant waves all over time, another which is converging to an equilibrium, and a third which is diverging, but they're all doing it in cyclical ways. So those are three possible cases for a model involving um, complex numbers. And the point is that when you get a complex number solution, you've got something which is cyclical. And that's what we're trying to do in the economics here, is how do we understand the cycles in an economy using mathematics? And what time are we about to here? Take a bit of a break. I know it's both tedious and for some and boring, for others and a bit weird, but we'll just keep on going and I'll give you a bit of a, bit of a background to it as we go through. For you on this lecture, I'm up to about halfway through what I've finished, which is about half what I wanted to cover. Uh, but what, I'm, what we've done is I've got to the stage of saying you can have a solution for a, a, a second order ordinary differential equation, which involves the roots are complex because the parabola doesn't cross the x-axis, invent the idea of imaginary numbers for it, and when you put them into a model, you actually find you get cycles out of it. And this is one of the deepest discoveries in mathematics, the link between the exp exponential uh, function and trigonometry, sine and cosine. And I, I give us a, a very brief explanation of it here, not, uh, not too complicated, but it still starts off pretty weird because remember when I said you've got a, you've got a, if you've got a linear second order ordinary differential equation, it will have, you, you, you have a guess solution, you guess of some constant times e to the lambda times t because it can be converted across to being a quadratic, you get two solutions, okay? And you have a linear combination of the two will give you the entire behaviour of the system. When you get a complex number, you, they come in what are called complex conjugates. So if you look at the solutions I've got up here, let's just take a look at the solutions here. Let's see. Uh, where else are we? I stuffed up with a little exercise there, but I'll get back to that later. So I've got minus a half plus the square root of 3 over 2 times i and minus a half minus the square root of 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by i. So you've got a, the, the, the real part, of the, which, what we call the real part of a complex number or an imaginary number, is the first bit. And that's, minus, that's the minus b over 2a of the quadratic solution. Okay? You get that on both, both, both solutions, and you get the plus and minus of this complex number. So they come in very specific little pairs. And again, here, when I've got this solution down here, x squared plus 100 is equal to 0. Okay. That's got two solutions, 10 times i and minus 10 times i. The real part of that is 0. Okay. So the real part, the two solutions have got identical real part and complex parts, which are one's the negative of the other. That's, by definition, that's what you get out of a solution which involves complex numbers. Now, what that means is, and I, I go through the working here, the, the thing that you, you get uh, a complex, you get, you get two solutions which you add together to get the overall solution. It takes a bit of logic to work it out, and that's what the stuff on the top of the board was earlier on, which I've decided was just too complicated to explain here. You can break it down into having two solutions, one of which is entirely real, and the other which is entirely real multiplied by 1 times i by the imaginary number. So your two bits are now a real bit and another real bit multiplied by square root of minus 1. Now the reason that matters is that when you work out the equations together, you find that you can, and I've just I've stated it in, in full terms here, here's the, here's the solution um, in terms of exponentials and quadratics. When you look at the solution itself, there's nothing imaginary about the solution. Those are all real numbers. So somehow you're combining, you've got solutions involving imaginary numbers, which can't be represented that way, giving you solutions which are all in terms of real numbers. Okay. So what you've got to do is map from the, from the imaginary numbers to real numbers. That's what we're doing here. So what are the, what's the function of imaginary numbers? It turns out the imaginary numbers describe the cycle. Okay. So the imaginary numbers can be mapped right across to cosine plus sine. Okay. Whereas the real part of it tells you how big those cycles are. So you can separate your dynamic system into two parts. One which tells you the magnitude of the cycles and the other which tells you the frequency of the cycles. Now, if your magnitude number is zero, then you get cycles of exactly the same magnitude through time. 
that's what the black one is. So that's the one where the solution is 10 times I and minus 10 times I. There's no real part, so the magnitude doesn't change. It remains constant. The one where you can see it converging, the red one, that's got a negative real part. So that will converge to zero over time in a cyclical fashion. The blue one, the real part, is positive. So the cycles will continue getting bigger over time. And those are your three fundamental cases of a solution that involves complex numbers. So what you can finally do your solution uh, is notice the constants are now multiplying the two, the sine and cosine transformations of, of the e to the um, i times time. And your ex explanation, first of all, has the magnitude given by the first part of your radical solution, so minus b over 2a. And the second part, we've mapped the b squared minus 4ac across the sine and cosine of 4ac minus b squared. Now, what's the reason for that? Notice that the, the usual solution is b squared minus 4ac up here, where I've got i involved. This, I've now said, is 4ac minus b squared. The reason for that is b squared minus 4ac is negative. Okay? If I separate that, I take out the... the so I, the, my solution, where b squared of minus 4ac is negative, is going to involve a complex number, the square root of minus 1. I can take that out through the process that I explain that bit of text there. And what I get is b, I get the square root of 4 squared minus... 4ac minus b squared, which is positive. So I've now got an argument to sine and cosine, which are in real terms. That's what you're doing the transformation there for. It doesn't actually change. It looks like it changes the value. It just gets rid of the negative in the square root to go for, from b squared minus 4ac to 4ac minus b squared. And in fact, when you go through the process, and I'll show you this little, little trick here, um, you just can take the bits and pieces of the, the roots you get out of this equation and plug them into the, to the solution. Again, this is what my maths lecturer described as money for old rope. It's complicated to understand what's going on. Once you know it, it's an organ grinder stuff. You just follow the procedure. So I've got this equation here saying the, the acceleration of the system plus two times its rate of, rate of change plus four times its current value is equal to zero. Again, that could be describing... Something like you know, a spring. If you pull the spring, it's going to fluctuate before it stabilises. This is the typical sort of system that people are solving when they're going through a first-year course in, in, in uh, differential equations. So I do put this in and say, OK, what's the solution? Using exactly the same formula, the, you know, b squared minus 4ac over 2a, et cetera, et cetera, I get these two roots, minus 1 plus the square root of 3 times i and minus 1 minus the square root of 3 times i. I can simply say the, the real bit is going to be e multiplied by minus 1 to the times t. So that maps down to here. And the square root of 3, forget about the i, because I, I handle the i by converting them into cosine and sine. It's going to be con some constant times the cosine of the square root of 3 times t, plus another constant times the sine of the square root of 3 times t. Now, what that means is this one is telling you how big the cycles are. This bit tells you what it tells you the cycles themselves, and the magnitude of what you're multiplying time by within cosine and sine says how fast do the cycles occur. Now, if you think about if you had cosine, if, if, the, if that solution happens to be one, so you have cos, cos of t plus sine of t, okay, they have a period of two pi. So if you're looking at how long does a cycle take to go from the beginning of a boom to the beginning of the next boom, and the answer was one for the value there, it would be you know, two times pi, which is about six and a half years for the cycle to recur. If you have a bigger number there, it's a smaller cycle. So that's, that's the role of that particular calculation, working out the period. And just to show you the result of that simulation, I've got this strict equation here, stated as a differential equation, which MathCAD and numerous other programs can solve for me. And then I've got the solution I've worked out here, given a couple of values for C1 and C2. So I do the solution and I say the system passes through uh, at y at 0, the value, the value of the system is 1 and its rate of change, what that dash there indicates, is also 1. Um, but there's the, so the solution to the differential equation done by MathCAD. But the solution I've worked that up here, which is saying it's equal to e to the minus t times the cosine of the square root of 3 times t plus 2 over the square root of 3 times the sine. 
all again worked out by um, the same sort of process that I showed you for the, uh, the equations not involving complex numbers. They two are identical, so that's what's going on there. Now, obviously economics has disappeared in all this. I want to get, bring it back to economics. Uh, and this is the start of doing it because that's not what, how I want you to solve dynamic systems. It's the way that most economists learn to do them and it's the way that I first learned when I did um, undergraduate you know, math economics a long, long time ago. Um, too long to remember. But it turns out mathematicians don't use that approach anywhere and I want to show you why with an actual example. So this is um, differential equations. You also have difference equations. If you're doing difference equations, I suppose, with Engelbert and other staff here, differential, have you done some difference equation models or not? You have, okay. Um, so they're much the same technique applies. With differential equations, you use E raised to some power as your guess solution. With a difference equation, you take some constant times a number R raised to the power of time. One converges to the other, you take smaller and smaller steps. But if you're working in terms of t minus 1 and t minus 2, you know, what, year, what the value this year, depending on some function of the last year or the year before that, then you use r raised to the power of t rather than e raised to the power of lambda times t to do your solution. So uh, the way we first got into it, I've just got an obviously error there. Hang on a second. Uh, when the way this economics got into this was you go right back to the general theory, and the general theory is mainly stated in terms of static equations. Now, where there are equations, there aren't very many. They're done without time attached to them. And Roy Harrod, who was one of um, the uh, Keynes's circle, what do they call the circus, didn't they? Keynes's circus, who, with whom he discussed the general theory, Harrod attempted to make it into a dynamic model. Now, a bit of background here. You all know the name Goodwin. Okay. Richard Goodwin was a, was a student at the same time in Cambridge as Harrod was doing all this work. And Goodwin was a far better mathematician, but he was a junior. A bit like one of you guys versus, versus me in that sense. Okay. And Goodwin tells me that he called Harrod part of the technique that Harrod used and Harrod didn't acknowledge him. Long story. So what we get with Harrod is actually a mistaken approach to dynamics. Goodwin finally gets us back on the right track. But when Harrod first did these essays, what he did was say he wanted, he wanted to, his, his solution to, um, to trying to dynamise Keynes, so I can find it in this particular lecture here, let's see. Ah, OK. Hang on. Hang on. Why is it? Hang on. Ah, maybe I haven't gotten this particular look. Let's see. Okay. Pardon me, looking at the wrong spot. Okay. What Harrod did was take a definition for investment and definition for savings and modify them in such a way that they appeared to be dynamic. So he took I over he took investment is equal to savings as a initial starting point. Thinking in terms of Keynes's you know, y, C plus I equals C plus S, therefore I equals S, that starting point. And then so, well, let's now make it dynamic somehow. So we, first of all, divide by Y. So we, I over y, y is equal to S over Y. And then we multiply both of them by delta Y over delta Y. And then we shuffle the terms around. That gave him what he called a fundamental equation relating the rate of change of the economy to a savings ratio and the, um, what he called the incremental capital output ratio. And that's all done in this essay here, or a book, and then an essay, essay, and then three other books where he pretty much repeats the same stuff. There's not much progress over 40 years in, or 30 years in the way that Harrod explained all this. But he starts off uh, with a, an unstable system, but it's not stated in terms of differential equations or difference equations. Now, along comes John Hicks. Actually, not John Hicks. Along comes J.R. Hicks. You know, you, know, you know that John Hicks decides himself into two people? You don't? Okay. J.R. Hicks was a neoclassical. John Hicks is a post-Keynesian. And J.R. Hicks, John Hicks basically rejects everything J.R. Hicks did. And this all dates from the 
late 70s when he was trying as, as a genuine, genuine intellectual, a genuine non-ideological thinker in that sense, he was trying to come to grips with uncertainty. And he was discussing all the time with Paul Davidson. And Paul Davidson was trying to convince him, you cannot model uncertainty as risk, et cetera, et cetera. And he finally persuaded um, Herrick Hicks that Paul was right, J.R. Hicks was wrong. You couldn't do what J.R. Hicks did to model Keynes. Therefore, the ISLM model was false because it presumed a level of knowledge about the future that you couldn't possibly have. So from that point on, he started calling himself John Hicks when he published articles. And the very first time he published an article, not the first, the second, but the one that was probably most influential in the post-Keynesian literature, he published in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics as the thank you to Paul Davidson. Only one problem, no neoclassical on the planet read it. None of them know that a paper even exists. But from that point of view on, J.R. Hicks rejected what I'm going to rejected what he did to Keynes, but he also did the same thing to Harrod. So you find that out of an equation. Can you see that easily enough on the board there, that equation? Okay. He had an equation which gave you a, a cyclical model which says y at time t, so the output at time t, is 1 minus s plus c times y at t minus 1, so output the year before, minus c times y at t minus 2, so output two years further back. And that was the equation. Hicks being a, a Within his limitations, a very good mathematician, uh, and it's limitations of knowledge rather than limitations of technique, that became the model for the trade cycle. And Alvin Hansen developed a very similar model, and so did Paul Samuelson. So it's called the multiplier accelerator model. Have you done that at all in classes elsewhere? Yeah. With here or? Yeah, it's in one of the uh, articles. Who was it with? Who? Uh, in Engelberts. Engelberts, okay. Did you all treat it as a serious model? Was it treated as a serious model? Um, yes, but um, it was, I think, a literature summary of it was saying that this is how it has been done. It should be that way. Yeah, it shouldn't be done because it's not a decent model. Yeah. It's not a mathematical <laughs> model. And that's what I established back when I was doing my master's degree. So I want to take you through this exercise of how you find that out because... Uh, let's look at how Hicks derived it. He started off by defining savings this way. He said savings in time t is output in it's output savings in the year t. So savings in 1960, okay, is output in 1960 minus one minus the savings rate times output in 1959. In other words, he's saying your consumption is based on your income last year. That sounds sensible to you? Nonsense, okay? It was done for a specific reason. He couldn't get a dynamic equation by saying savings now is based pretty much on consumption now. If you think about your time lag in your consumption, you are spending pretty much what you earned last week. If you're wealthy, you might be spending a bit what you earned last year, but there's the time relations for savings are very different for those for investment, which is one of the many problems of doing difference equations as a way of modelling something as complex as a capitalist economy. That's what he started from. So this definition for savings, and he then said investment is motivated by the change in the level of output in the previous two years. So saying investment in time to year, year T, say events for say in 2015, is some constant times the change in output between 2014 and 2013. Does that sound reasonable? Not necessarily the length of time. Yeah. It sounds a little bit like Kalecki's investment. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty much inventory, the model of inventory investment. Okay? Your change in the your orders of new inventory will be driven by the change in the change in the, in the stock of, of goods you have in the back room. So you get a, it's fair enough to use that as an expression of desired investment, which I'll get to in a moment. So anyway, S here is supposed to be the savings rate. And most of the time, people did the model, they'd guess a savings rate of about, you know, between 0.1 and 0.3, that sort of level. That's, in terms of, that's the, if, given that the idea you've got an investment equal to savings, an investment, say, in a sensible economy, unlike the British economy, would be about 25% of GDP. Here it's about 10, okay? So your value for S, if you say it's going to be savings is, is, is investment, you're going to use much that same value for the savings rate, so you're going to have a value of S of 0 0.25, 0 0.3, that sort of level. Okay, So you start with that value for S. Obviously, Dom, I've sobered up. 
<laughs> I'm feeling better than yesterday. Okay, so I'm going to say, let's assume the S, S is 0.25. Okay. What about the value for C? Well, Hicks rushed over this bit, J.R. Hicks rushed over this bit, but we can actually work out roughly what it should be because if you say the savings rate is 25% and you're assuming equilibrium, so investment's the same percentage of output as, as GDP is of income, then if you divide I at T by Y at T, you're going to get a ratio of 0.25, which is the same as the savings rate you're working with. Okay? And I'm then dividing, because I've got this expression to start with, I'm going to divide C of uh, this expression by YT as well. And let's just imagine you've got a 4% rate of growth of the economy, roughly speaking. I'm just doing this for a sake of illustration. So if output was 90, 92 two years ago and 96 one year ago and 100 now, your value is going to be 96 minus 92 divided by 100, which is 4 divided by 100. So I've got to, I can now derive roughly what, given those conditions of that rate of growth and that level of investment, or the savings rate, C should be roughly equal to the solution to that equation, and that gives you a value for C of 6.25, okay? 25 over 4. So roughly speaking, if you want to say what magnitude you should be using to be realistic about the value for C, it should be something big, like about 6. Now, the reason that Hex was going through this um, process, let's go back and find it here. Um, this is Harrod describing his own model. And this is what Hicks at the stage is trying to interpret and, and, and uh, explain more deeply. Harrod, in exactly the same way, interpreted and explained more deeply Keynes. Oh, he stuffed them both up completely. Okay? We've got ISLM out of Hicks's alleged reading of Keynes. And I've already explained to you it wasn't a reading of Keynes. It was his own model re remap. That's what he told us in the 7980 paper he wrote in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. But here what he's saying is, well, here's Harrod giving us cycles because of an unstable equilibrium. And this is Harrod's statement of it. A, a warranted unique growth rate is determined. On either side, there's a field in which centrifugal forces operate. Departure from the warranted line sets up an inducement to depart further from it. The move in equilibrium is this a highly unstable one. Now, that's really pretty much, in, in mathematical terms, he's defining a saddle there. Okay. If you're right on the ridge, just like the neoclassicals have in DSG models, then you can stay there, but the tiniest deviation moves you away. Unlike the neoclassicals, Harrod said you will have deviations, therefore you've got an unstable equilibrium, and Harrod was happy about that because it gave him an explanation for a force of divergence in cycles over time, which is where he saw himself as being very different to the general theory. Along comes J.R. Hicks. He doesn't like that, and here's his critique. He says, Harrod welcomes the instability of his system because he sees it as an explanation for the tendency for fluctuation we see in the real world. And notice the punchline. But a mathematically mathematical instability does not itself elucidate fluctuation. A mathematically unstable system does not fluctuate. It just breaks down. That is mathematically false. It's true of linear systems, but it's not true of nonlinear systems. But with that belief, Hicks went on to say, how can I make this model stable? So his whole idea of doing the, the difference equation I'm showing you now was to get to the point where he had a stable alternative to Hicks to Harrod's unstable insight. Only one problem. Given the value that I've just shown you this equation has for C, it should be if, if S is about 0.25 and if the growth rate for the economy is about 4%, then C should be about 6.25. That's well into the range where this gives you instability doesn't give you, it, it gives him what he was getting, trying to get away from. How do you think you solve the problem? Making an assumption. Making an assumption that C was much smaller than it should be. He assumed it was below one. Okay. Now, when he did that, I'll show you the, I'll show you the impact of doing this. Let's look at the model here. So there's, this is now Hicks's model. And it's the one, the reason it matters so much to me is that, as well as doing an essay on it for my masters, like you guys are doing, your essays now, it was also the model that, he, that, that, that uh, Minsky used when he was applying his mathematics to try to mathematically model financial instability. So his model had C, I think it was. Yeah, C was a varying function of time. Try to make a varying function of time and explain a transition from one state of this particular model to another state, giving explosive 
uh, berms to explosive slumps. That was his attempt to explain it. So I sort of, I didn't particularly like the model when I first saw it because I don't think, I knew enough mathematics not to like difference equations to simulate capitalism when I first learned this model. But what I did was I applied the mathematics I'm going to show you in a moment as to how you analyse these systems, not just using polynomials, but using matrices. And I got quite a surprising result. It surprised me at the time anyway. Of course, I understand it now. So, but if you, here you have Hicks trying to get um, a stable version for this model, but getting a system which is massively unstable, so the only way to force it to be stable is to make an absurd assumption about the value of C, which he did, and he got away with it because neoclassicals believe the economy returns to equilibrium. So this became the, the dominant model, even though they had to use totally unrealistic value for C. That's if I feed in a value of 6 for C, 6.25, that's the solution I've shown you above, then what this model says is that starting from a level of GDP of 100 by year, I think it is year five, your GDP will be minus 60,000. Not exactly a sensible model. Okay, so something is going badly wrong there. Now, if you choose, on the other hand, a value for C of one, then you get perfectly re reproducing cycles. And if you choose a value for C below one, the cycles diminish over time, but you get an equilibrium output of, G of GDP of zero. So how did he turn that into a model of growth over time? He imposed a growth trend. Okay? And that's what became the... So I'm presuming the Gobert would have shown you the one with the growth trend added in as well. And then to keep the cycles occurring, you needed exogenous shocks. So what have we done? We've gone from Keynes back to Frisch again. Okay? Hicks has completely emasculated Harrod, just like he emasculated Keynes beforehand with the ISLM model. So a man who actually meant to do very, very good did an enormous amount of damage. And I just want to show now using the technique I've showed you already for solving linear differential equations, you can do exactly the same thing for difference equations. So let's see what solution you get out of the characteristic equation approach. And you have, what you do is, rather than saying y at t is e to the power of lambda times t, which is what you do for differential equations, you say, I'm going to guess that y at t is some constant, um, well, I'm leaving the constant out of here for simplicity, uh, if it, if y at t is r raised to the power of t. And that's, that's because you think about compound interest, it's the, the same basic idea as compound interest. So if y at t is r to the power of t, then y at t plus 1 is r to the t plus 1, and y at t plus 2 is r to the t plus 2. Okay? So you feed that into your solution, and here's your equation. You then guess that you can substitute uh, y at t plus 2 to being r raised to the power of t plus 2, y at t plus 1 being r to the t plus 1, and y at t being r to the t. You then get an equation where you have three terms in r to the t, and then r, t, r squared, r, and, and a constant. And because r, any number raised to a power is, is never going to be zero, okay, you can take the rt outside and you can say, well, I'm going to break rt plus 2 minus 1, uh, 1 minus s plus c times rt minus 1 plus c times r to the t, divide through by rt, take it outside. Since rt can't be zero, this is, has to be zero to give me a solution. So now we're doing exactly the same thing. We're using a quadratic to find the roots that give us the right value. So you do all that, and you feed that, and say, what solution do you get? And there are your two solutions. Again, the whole thing, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. In this case, it becomes 1 minus s plus c, which is your b term here, divided by 2, which is your a term. Over here, there's, there's, no, no, there's one, 1 times r squared as the start of the equation. And here's your radical. And that radical involves a complex number. Okay. Given the mag, you've got to have, unless you choose very strange magnitudes for the equation, you're going to get a complex number coming out, so you can get a cycle. So it's a cyclical model. It looks like it's going in the right direction. So I'm going to then solve it. I get this, if I put that into an equation, you get a hellishly complicated expression. And you'll find Samuelson, in particular, spends lots of time going through what are the, what are the various classes of behaviour. For some values of 1 minus s plus c squared minus 4 times c, you're going to get a real number. For others, you're going to get a complex number. For others, you're going to get uh, ones where the 
where the magnitude grows over time. For others, you'll get it collapsing over time. And all these different states will be shown on, on old textbooks about the behavior of this equation. It is not a model. But you don't find out that it's not a decent model by doing the characteristic equation approach. So I was lucky in the sense that I, I was studying, while I was doing my master's degree, I was also sitting in on mathematics courses. And what I found with the mathematics courses was that's old hat. They, they teach students how to do characteristic equation to get you weaned onto how you use analogy to solve differential equations or difference equations. But once you've done it for a while, they say, right, we're going to forget about that stuff and start using matrices. Now, what's the advantage of doing matrices? Well, what you do with a matrix, you take an equation, which is a second order equation here. So it's got terms in uh, being the difference equation Second orders, like the difference equa differential equation will be the second differential, d2y dt squared, third order is d3y dt cubed, and so on. For difference equation, it's going to be t plus 2 depending on t plus 1 and t. So that makes it a second order difference equation. You do exactly the same thing with, with differential equations as I'm showing here, but you, you make up another variable, x1 at t and x2 at t, and you define x1 at t to be equal to y at t. Well, then for x1 at t plus 1 is going to be y at t plus 1. Then you find another variable called x2 at t, which you say is equal to y t plus 1. So xt at 2 plus 1 is going to be y at t plus 2. That's your actual equation. That's what you're trying to solve. So you then say, well, I can just say y at t plus 2 is actually equal to the variable x2 at t plus 1. And what I've done is I've reduced a second order equation to a first order equation. So if I have, if I have, a, if I have a, a second order system, I can make it into two related first order systems. And if I have a third order equation, I can make it into three related first order systems. So what you're doing is reducing the order to two equations which are both first order. That's the first step. And when you do it, you now get this expression here. So I've got xt, x, x2 of t, X2, the second of, I should have had XA and XB. I, I might change that in notation later. But this is two variables you've invented. So X2 is equal to 1 minus S plus C times X1 at T plus 1 minus C times X1 at T. And that's just reworked it. Once I've done that, I can now say, well, let's actually express this as a matrix equation. So I now have X1 at T plus 1 is equal to X2T. Okay, That's the simple relationship between these two new variables I've invented. And x2 at t plus 1 is the entire equation. So if I now express this as an actual matrix, I've got x1 at t plus 1 and x2 at t plus 1 are equal to x2 at t and 1 minus s plus 2c times x2t minus c times x1t. And then if you put it in matrix forms, I now get a matrix out of this. And there's my matrix. I'm now saying x1 and x2 at t plus 1 are going to be this matrix times x1 at t and x2 at t. So I've now got a matrix which represents the dynamic equation. And what's the advantage of doing that? Well, it looks more cumbersome. It's obviously more work than just <coughs> plugging in. Because once you see a, a set of linear second-order differential equations, you can just basically take the, co the, take the coefficients out, whack it into the formula for the quadratic and get the solution and on you go. All you've got to do is work out the initial conditions. This way is a lot more complicated initially. But the payoff for it is that something about the value, the properties of the matrix tell you whether the system is valid or not. So I, having done in class like you guys have done, I'm, did you do the characteristic equation approach with that model or just talk about it and go on with Engelbert? I don't it must have been on Flash. You remember the model, but you wouldn't have done the analysis of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, to do an anal analyze it, you'd normally do the characteristic stuff, which I've done up above. But what mathematicians would do is look at it and say, well, let's make it into a matrix. Now, I'll explain in a moment why this is the case. But for this to be a valid model, to actually be describing a real, a real, a realistic model of a existing system, that matrix must, in some fashion, be equal to zero must be a property of the matrix that is comparable to it being equal to zero. The reason for that is you don't want to be able to invert it. Because if you, if you have an equation and you've got x times z equals x, 
Okay. You don't want z to be zero. Okay. I'll explain this slightly a bit better in a moment on this front. But you don't want to be able to. What what it comes down to is you don't want to be able to invert the matrix. Have you done matrix matrices sufficiently to do matrix inversion? Or well, that's a Okay, some of you haven't done matrix inversions. Matrix inversions are simple ways of solving an equation because if you have a, a set of simultaneous equations, you have, you know, um, y equals uh, a times x plus b times z, and then y is equal to c times x plus d times z, then you've got, you've got a two... You're trying to work out a, work out a solution that gives you the, like the, where the two curves intersect fundamentally. You're throwing away the variables and just working with the array of numbers. That's what a matrix is. It's a simple way of abstracting from the variables, and then the property of that array is, is very easy to process. Is a huge part of computing is based on doing that. Um, so matrices are a particular type of mathematics, and just like there's an inverse for three, the inverse of three is one is one third. Multiply three by one third, you get one. Okay, that's inverting a scalar. There's also a way of inverting matrices as well. So I can say what's the What's the value of this matrix raised to the power of minus 1, which is 1 over the matrix? It's exactly the same as what's the inverse of 3. It's 1 over 3. The program tells me there actually is an inverse. Now, that tells you something that you can't tell from the characteristic equation approach. It's not a valid model. And I'll show you why that's the case in a moment. Because what you're trying to do with the matrix version of this equation and working with differential equations, that's the matrix version, of saying the rate of change of y, where y is a vector, y might be including investment, consumption, private debt level, that sort of thing. So three variables is some function of the current values of those variables, then that is a matrix version of the equation you've been working with so far. And for the difference equations, much the same sort of thing applies. There's y at t plus 1 is a matrix times y at t, and that's in this particular case, we're working with this matrix here. So it's a matrix way of expressing a difference or a differential equation. And what you start off is saying, well, that's, again, the same sort of story as for a scalar set of equations, the ones we've been doing examples of so far. You state it as dx, d, dx dt equals a times x, that's dy dt equals some constant times y, rather than a being a symbol number now, it's, a, it's an array of numbers called the matrix. So you, again, same basic idea, you, you presume a guess solution, x at time t is equal to the lambda times t times a constant, and I left that out of the earlier stuff just for simplicity and notation, but your constant now is a vector. If you're working with a two-part uh, equation, it'll be two numbers, three part, it's three, etc., etc. So let's look at that. Your guess, guess solution of x at t is e raised to the for, for, a, for a continuous time version, e lambda to the lambda times t multiplied by v. You start here, that's your equation. You're trying to solve this equation, dx dt equals a times x. You guess the solution is x at t is e to the lambda times t multiplied by a vector of constants. Therefore, when you differentiate, you're going to get lambda times e to the lambda t times that vector coming out again. So if you assume that's your guess solution, you're saying I'm guessing the solution to this equation here is the differential of this system. I get lambda times either the lambda times t times v, and that is lambda times x itself, the way with you. That's, that's, that's lambda times x there. Now, you've got two expressions for dx dt. There's one. That's what you start from. This is the second, which you've, your guess solution comes from. Since they're the same thing, you can equate them. So you equate them. You say dx dt is equal to a, a times x, where a is a matrix. It's also equal to lambda times x, where lambda is a, a single scalar, single number. And that means that a times x minus lambda times x is equal to zero. Now, let's actually spell it out in more detail, because x in this case is not a single number. It's two numbers in a row, vector one, vector, number, value one, value two, arranged in a, in a, a vector. And that's, that's the full way of stating a dx, d, d, t of this vector, which has two values, is some matrix A, B, C, D, multiplied by x1 and x2, and it's equal to lambda multiplied by x1 and x2. And that's the idea. Again, it's exactly the same thing as like population growth being smooth over time. This might be investment and consumption growing smoothly, same ratio and so on. 
Um, but to actually solve this equation, I now put it, if I now put it, if I now subtract this bit from that bit, I've now got an expression saying the matrix times x1 and x2 minus lambda times x1 and 2 is equal to the vector 0, which is two numbers, 0, 0. Now, to group this properly, I've got to multiply through by it's called the identity matrix to be able to... I've got to group this in x1 and x2. I've got to multiply, first of all, by a matrix to make lambda into also matrix form. So I do that. And I get A, B, C, D minus lambda, 0, 0, lambda, all multiplied by x1, x2 is equal to 0 and 0. So I then, I can now take lambda inside and say A minus lambda, B, C, D minus lambda, multiplied by x1, x2 is equal to 0. Now, that can be true under two circumstances. Notice the solution is 0. Multiplying two numbers together is 0. There's two possible answers. One or the other numbers is 0. Do you want x1 and x2 to be 0? That's saying your variables for all time are 0. That is a non-equation. It is not a genuine model, if that happens. So you know your model is not a valid model. What you want is somehow this to be equivalent to 0. And that comes down to what's called the determinant. Now, I didn't get past this point for writing this lecture. That's the next stage of the exercise. But when you work out the determinant, that gives you a, uh, a polynomial, but you want this thing to be not, you want it to be not possible to invert this because if I can invert that, and actually I can do this live, I think, um, then if there's an inverse for this, let's just delete that, and I'll then pre-multiply by that matrix raised to the power of minus one, that's saying your variables are equal to a matrix multiplied by zero and that anything multiplied by, by zero is zero. You don't want that outcome. But with Hicks equation, you do get that outcome. Now, I, uh, what time have we got here? Another hour to go? Okay, let's take a break and I'll, I'll spend a bit of time now. Nobody talk to me, okay? I'm going to try to get the, find a section where I explain why that was a mistake and what the solution is. And that's a bit of a prelude to saying for, for the next week's lecture, when I do the extra lecture, I'll go through applying the same concepts to Goodwin's models and then my model and show you their stability properties, which gets into the properties of nonlinear differential equations, which is where I want to end up this course on. Okay? Ten minute break. So what I've shown you so far is just that this model's only got three particular outcomes and it's not a model at all. There's something seriously wrong with it to get to this particular um, situation. I'll just dash through this some old lectures using VizSim, which I used to use. So exactly what I've shown you beforehand, all this little process, getting the matrix outcome, yada, yada, yada. Um, bang, bang, bang. I'll show that that's invertible, which you don't want. Uh, okay. Now, bing, bing, bing. That's <laughs> when you put it together, that's the sort of nonsense you get out of it. People found this really complicated. Pity it's wrong. Um, I want to went through here. Okay, part I want to get to is here. Um, if that was, as I said, it's all nonsense. There's something seriously wrong with the model. And you go back and take a look and say, well, where the hell did it come to? For a start, what he's doing in this equation here, let's go back and take a look at the document I've just put together here. He's starting, where are we, from this relationship, defining savings that way. Now, that itself is invalid. Okay? You should be having, fundamentally, if you're working in discrete time, then you should be presuming that savings this year is a function of income this year. Okay? So the time lag is wrong. But the real punchline is down here. Is what he's saying is that investment is C multiplied by the change in output in the previous two years. And you Samuelson modified that to have it being the level of consumption as well. So you had one minus S inside there too. Um, that's not, that is not investment. What's investment? It's the rate of change of capital stock, isn't it? Okay. So you actually want to find what actual investment is. 
then what you have to have is investment this year is the change in capital stock this year. So IT would be KT minus KT minus 1 if you're doing in discrete time. So that's not a definition of actual investment at all. It's a definition of desired investment. Now, is there any economic theory that says desired investment is equal to actual savings? Yeah, pass could do. Pretty close. Okay, that'll do. Oh, you've got to pass for that. Um, but there's, that is not Keynes. Keynes said actual investment is equal to actual savings. Yeah? The causal mechanism of investment causes the savings that's generated by the investment. So it wasn't a Keynesian model at all. It was a false starting point. Again, very typical of Hicks, unfortunately being more glib with the mathematics in some ways than he should have been because he wasn't... Nothing stopped him getting to this result. He wanted to get to the equilibrium outcome. And he got there by hook or by crook, but he made logical as well as mathematical errors in the process. Or not mathematical errors here, but logical errors because he's equating an expression for supposed actual savings, which itself is false, and done only so he'll get cycles out of it, with another equation for actual investment, which is not actual investment, it's desired investment. So that's that's the situation I said, that's why the model didn't work. So I looked at that and thought, well, not that I want you to do difference equations in economics, but is there any way to retrieve this? Is there any way you can actually look at what he's doing here and say, what can you get out of it as a proper model? And this is, if you want to have a crack at this, for those who've got the mathematics to give it a try, you could try doing, if you're not still hit with the flu, or another assignment. You got another assignment? You might course next. Forget it. Okay, don't worry about it. But I'll, <laughs> I'll show you the basic story. So, what you can say is that um, you can you can define actual investment and say that actual investment is desired investment is carried out. So, desired investment becomes actual investment. That changes the level of capital stock. That changes output, and that gives you a cycle, a causal cycle. So that's what I did there. Um, let's go, okay. So he starts from this argument, investment is identical to consumption plus investment, and that's an ex post identity. And what Hicks and Samuelson and Hansen all use is this definition, which is not an ex post identity, it's a definition of desired investment. Um, and then they equate the two together, getting nowhere, but actual investment is a change in capital stock. Now let's just assume, and this is getting more realistic here, that there's some accelerated relationship between the level of output and the level of capital stock. So if you say, um, we know empirically we measure this is between two and four. I've gone through the energy foundations this actually has earlier in the course, but just for the simplicity, start with an assumption that economists were happy to use at the time. Output is some function of the capital stock, and you use V for a constant. Um, when you substitute, what you get is investment, is V multiplied by the change in output in YT minus YT minus 1. So you've lost the time lag. You've got one less time lag, okay? And it's a definition now for actual investment. If you then say there's unlagged consumption, say consumption this year is 1 minus the savings rate times income this year, what you get is this expression, 1 minus S multiplied by YT plus V times YT minus minus 1, you get a straight growth equation. You get y t is going to be the accelerator divided by the accelerator minus the savings rate, therefore it's going to be greater than 1, multiplied by output the previous year. You get simple exponential growth, which of course is not what Harrod was trying to, to get. Now, what you've got here is a... Uh, we had an unjustified lag in consumption uh, you have a desired investment as a lag function of output. What it's actually asking, what this model actually asks, as Hicks and, and, uh, as, and Sam Hansen and Samuelson wrote it, is saying, given that investment and consumption are both functions of uh, income, uh, what level of output would guarantee that they're identical, that they're both a function of time? And given that if you've, got, you've got actual savings and desired investment, okay, what level of output will, if they're both functions of output, what level of output will guarantee that they're the same zero output? Okay. It's a non-model. So that was, unfortunately, which waste, wasted a huge amount of time with economic, economists, whereas if they'd applied the mathematical technique I've shown you, the, the matrix equation, somebody would have spotted a rat 30 or 40 years ago. 
And as it happens, I spotted the rat when I did my master's degree at New South Wales University in 1987-88. So it's a a non-model. It shouldn't have been used at all. But what I thought was the same is, can you salvage anything from it? Is there any way to make it uh, worthwhile? So I said, well, let's assume, let's accept that's a reasonable definition of desired investment in a discrete time model. So you say investment, desired investment at time t is some c, which represents a, a, a animal spirits thing, multiplied by the change in output in the previous two years. Assume that capitalists actually carry out the plans they have. So that becomes the addition to capital stock. So capital stock is this year is capital stock last year plus investment last year. I've now got a definition that investment last year is this lot. And I'm also saying that output this year is the accelerator relationship times capital this year. So I get investment determining capital stock, determining output, determining consumption with a lag, giving you investment. You've got a causal cycle coming out of it. You put that equation together, pardon me, the very bad animation there. So I've got output this year is the accelerator times capital stock this year. That's V times capital stock last year plus investment last year. This is 1 over V times Yt minus 1 last year. I then feed in this expression for the desired investment becoming actual investment that year. And I finally get this expression. Investment output in tier T is output in year T minus 1 plus the animal spirits factor over the actual capital output ratio multiplied by the change in output in the previous two years. So I've got a third order system. So if I express this in the vector system, I get three equations, three first order equations. And that ends up having a non-invertible matrix, meaning it's a genuine model. Now, if you look at it, what you get out of this, and I'll, I'll, this is only a very brief part of the lecture, I'll do more. I'll, I'll start here with the online lecture we give next week and then go on from there. Uh, first of all, if you have any, just go back and take a look at that equation. You've got yt is equal to yt minus 1 plus something. So your equilibrium is going to be non-zero. Okay? If there's no investment, then this year's output will be last year's output. Okay? So you, get, you don't get a zero solution anymore. You get a, a positive solution. And if you look at the eigenvalues, then they're much more sensible. Remember how complicated the Higgs one was? A huge mess. I get a very simple set of eigenvalues out of this. It's saying one, which is pretty much saying this year's output will be last year's output if there's no investment. And then the two eigenvalues I get out are um, the square root of the, the investment, the desired investment over actual investment. This is dropping out the complex numbers part of it. If C is greater than V, you're going to get indefinite growth. So if you have capitalists who wish to invest desired investment exceeds the actual capital output ratio, you're going to get continuous growth out of it. If it's equal to each other, you're going to get linear growth. And the cycles remain proportionate because with the, the y, yt is equal to yt minus 1 effectively gives you stability or growth over time. And the, the, the change in output is proportional to the level of output itself. What you get out of it then is this sort of model. Okay. Now you're working with something rather more realistic. So, uh, pardon, I'm going to the Goodman model there. So what I'll do next week is explain how I derive that, and then we'll work out the eigenvalue stuff for it, which is part of the, you know, organ grinder monkey working out how to do this stuff properly. And then I'll go into Goodwin's model, where Goodwin model came from, and then we can analyse Goodwin's model. And what we'll find with Goodwin's model is that that's a set to, it's a two-dimensional model. Okay, it's it's fundamentally got it's got investment occurring, and um, Again, on my, too much alcohol last night's affecting my ability to think on my feet. Uh, but it's a two-dimensional model, employment rate and wage share of GDP. Okay, those are the two variables. When you work out as a matrix, you get a matrix which has only, when you work out its determinant, it's only got complex parts. So you get cycles of the same magnitude over time, which is why you get that repeated cycle in the Goodwin model. When I added in debt as a third argument to it, then it becomes a three-dimensional model. You then get a system which has one real eigenvalue and two complex eigenvalues. And the reason for the the real... When you think about... When you go to a three-dimensional model, you go from the properties... Even though I'm going to solve it using matrices, the matrices is what's called the determinant maps across to a 
a, uh, a, a third order polynomial, a cubic. Think about a cubic equation, it always crosses the y axis, the x axis somewhere. Okay? You cannot have a cubic that doesn't cross the x axis, which means there has to be one real eigenvalue. That's a given. And that's partly where complex system behavior comes from. So when I analyze my model, what you'll find is we first of all have one real eigenvalue, and it's normally with the values you feed in for realistic values for the various parameters negative. So that's a stable eigenvalue. You're going to be attracted towards whatever your equilibria are because there are three equilibria. Now, of those equilibria, one, the, one is the, um, um, has negative values for wages, share and employment. So you can rule that out. It's an, it's an equilibrium of the mathematical system, but it's not a realistic description of capitalism. So there's only two realistic equilibria out of the system. One of them has a finite employment rate, a finite uh, wage share of GDP, and a finite debt to GDP ratio, which Matthias Roselli called the good equilibrium when he did, he and uh, Costa Lima did the, uh, it's Bernard Costa Lima, we're getting my alcohol levels dropping enough to remember the uh, Bernard's last name. Hi, Bernard. Last name. Um, so that that um, oh, I got myself distracted again. I shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, they call it the good equilibrium. Okay. Now to work, the other equilibrium has zero wages share, zero employment, and infinite debt. And to handle it technically, what they did was they defined they had another variable which is one over the debt ratio. So they had to go into zero as well. So the one over the debt ratio goes to infinity, then one over it goes to zero. So they had this bad equilibrium with zero, zero, zero as its properties. You don't want to go there. Okay, that's where you don't want to end up. But it turns out the um, because it's a nonlinear system, the dynamics are not determined just by what happens around the equilibrium. It depends how far away you get from it. Your initial conditions can get you in trouble. Okay, you can start from initial conditions that take you to the bad equilibrium. And the initial system and the bad equilibrium itself. Um, can be stable while the good one's unstable. And you've got to look at what you, when you see, when you do the analysis, you find changes in the values of the eigenvalues depending on the initial conditions and depending also upon uh, the values for the various parameters, how aggressive capitalists are as investing and so on. And we'll go through and I'll show you all that stuff next week. Okay. So I might just stop recording there. Um,